So in the middle of a contentious divorce, a mother and daughter seek shelter in a new apartment. And what turns out as, or starts off as a dream new home turns into a nightmare of leaking ceilings and uh, purses that keep reappearing. That's basically the story of Dark Water. I'm John Chang with Dan Edmonds. Yeah, live from color out of space over here. <laughs> So this time, um, you know, this is kind of like a wrap of the J-Horror thing. So I thought that like um, a question that really, you know, can kind of tie a bow on things is, you know, now that we've watched these and stuff, um, you know, what is it that like J-Horror achieves that like, you know, really the different American remakes um, try to, you know, duplicate and you know, as we just kind of discussed, do and don't, like, depending on different kind of levels and degrees. I would say they, they more, um, they attain a better um, sense of general atmosphere and tension, I would say, over a prolonged sort of period of the movie. Mm. Um, there's a much deeper psychological element to them than there is in Western horror movies, I would say. Um, with obviously some exceptions, but um, I would say they tell stories. They're more they're more focused on telling a story in a visual way rather than resorting to uh, tropes or tricks of the trade, so mm. to speak. Um, they're often more creative in terms of imagery because of the budgets seem to be a lot lower. Oh, right. Um, so yeah, and I, I would say they you know they just pull on the on the Japanese folklore of ghost stories mm -hmm. and you just, you just get that, that different take. Um, and they're, they're more happy to explore this idea that, um, the supernatural can cross over with, um, with normal life. And they don't feel like there has to be a, you know, a very concrete explanation for everything that it's just more ambiguous, I would say mm. in their storytelling, which gives them a nice kind of mystery. Um, so yeah, that would be my my kind of sum up. I would say. Yeah, I think for me, it's um, what if you know when you're talking about the budget, it feels a lot like how you know Rod Serling with the Twilight Zone would do a lot with such low you know television budgets and stuff. That that's different times what it's felt like as we've watched these, and I think sometimes you know the American version is really just yeah straight away the you know part of the cardinal sin that they make is that you know they have these bigger budgets so then right away they're getting to like kind of you know cgi and kind of you know doing things that really get away from the the core story and stuff and the other thing is that like you know too many times like you were saying with the tropes and all that they kind of resort back to like kind of you know right away kind of establishing who the final girl is and stuff like that and you feel like everybody else is like kind of are these disposable characters whereas in the japanese originals pretty much like you know, even like kind of, you know, a very basic character isn't a throwaway one and stuff. And, um, and I feel like, you know, if anything, uh, the Dark Order, you know, both the uh, Japanese and the American version kind of goes a little bit counter to what some of the other remakes um, have done in that respect. And I think that's yeah. kind of one of the things that really will stand out as we kind of get more into it. Yeah, I think you're right. This definitely, a, this is very different in terms of a remake compared to the other remakes we've looked at. Um, yeah, I, w I would say um, definitely there is, uh, along with this sort of the ambiguity with uh, with J-horror, there is this, um, you know, there, there's this just um, uh, a way of telling stories, like you said, like with the Twilight Zone is a very good parallel because it's not necessarily about making out and out and jump scares. It's about finding something that is unsettling and will stay with you mm. after watching it. So I think Twilight right. Zone has a lot more in common with J horror than just sort of other Western horror in a way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, with the um, the first one, of course, the Japanese original, we just had the sense that like, um, even though they're like, <clears throat> rather than, um, you know, just focusing on like kind of eerie music or kind of, you know, as we've kind of seen with some of the other remakes and the American remakes, where it's like kind of just, you know, this kind of creating as quickly as possible, this kind of um, typical mood that you see in the horror uh, movie, there's just a sense of like something's kind of 
happening. Like it's almost like I feel like even though we're focused on you know this mother and daughter, um, there's just the sense that like something is happening around them and and, and slowly closing in. And yeah. um, and we kind of you know that kind of keeps going. And then you know as we go along, we start seeing glimpses of it. Uh, you know, first one being of course the you know the leaky ceiling and stuff. And um, and that's our. And then on top of that, there's also like kind of you know, um, just little kind of strange things happening with the elevator and <laughs> yeah. And and oh, um, by the way, uh, we'll, we'll definitely get into like kind of a weird, uh, real life story that kind of is a funny connection to all this. We'll kind of mention it as we kind of you know go further yeah, yeah. along. <laughs> that was that was very interesting, but yeah, no, I mean I would say yeah, water in in this kind of mm. it, like the ring is used as a visual symbol to connect the real world to the spiritual world, basically. Mm. Um, and this though, it's, it's used in, in a much more interesting way, I would say, because it's also kind of a, a symbol of the lack of control that the mother is, is experiencing. Like the more out of control she gets with her environment, the more water there is around. Right. So it's kind of like this, this, Im this imagery of um, submission, uh, sort of emotions running over and kind of instability, you know, everything is kind of, you know, her world is sort of getting washed away in a way. Mm. Um, and I would say, that, you know, this fundamentally, this is again, a kind of a haunted house story, a bit like the mm. grudge, but the, um, as I say though, this is my, for my, my interpretation of it is that it's kind of a lack of control around your environment which is why mm. it's set in an apartment block because you don't have much control about who your neighbors are or right. what else you've got to deal with. And they, they expand on that more, I would say in the remake, but I think it's this idea of, you know, you've got to deal with um, your kid running off at any one sort of time. <laughs> you've got to deal with sort of leaks, you know, it's almost like the a house is often sort of portrayed like an ego in the subconscious. And in this one, it's like things, her ego is becoming, or her stability and safety is becoming porous and the water's kind of coming in and basically it's kind of causing this instability or, mm. and, and things are just sort of going to all hell. And, and, and the more sort of water there is, the more she's sort of losing her mind, basically. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of how I interpreted it anyway. Yeah, this is probably the most striking part about um, this out of the J horror movies. is so psychological in the sense that, like, um, mm. you know, different times we're really not sure if there's really anything haunted going on, or is it like kind of, is it like she's imagining these things, and it's only like kind of you know as things really you know devolve or like kind of unravel that we start really seeing like okay like kind of because um, different times like we almost have the sense that like the water she's seeing is like kind of just, you know, more her um, obsession with like kind of, you know, the, the, the things on the ceiling and, um, you know, that there's kind of maybe her daughter's like kind of, you know, running around and kind of like, um, you know, basically that uh, she's kind of almost losing control of, you know, not only, you know, what's happening in her family kind of breaking up and stuff like that, but just like, you know, her, life as as she knew it and stuff like that that she's you know just feeling like i said this kind of loss of control and that things are starting to kind of really start flooding in um to kind of really uh overwhelming and it's funny how like water a lot of times like is a symbol of life as well and um and but at the same time i think it's also part of the japanese history and culture that you know between tsunamis and um you know different times like uh you know as we've kind of so I guess a little bit in the Samurai series and stuff that, um, you know, there's different moments that like the, the, the water like kind of definitely um, is not only a, a source of light, but also like can very much be, you know, a way that like, uh, yeah, it, it just threatens their existence and stuff. Yeah, it's, it's a very, it's a sort of a, an agent of change, a kind of, you know, unsettling thing and that, you know, it, it can disrupt everything. So, yeah. Definitely. And I mean, in this one, everything is kind of all of her life is in this kind of fluid state, mm. her marriage, her job, where she lives. She's constantly like <laughs> losing track of her child and things like this. So it's, right. yeah, it's very much kind of underpinned it all, I would say, with, with, the, with the water symbolism. And of course, we've got more bathroom related terror. You know, <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, more bathrooms just for, right. just for a change. So, yeah. And it, you know, like kind of going back to the thing of a 
feeling that the, you know things caving in and stuff. Um, I think what's interesting is that like they really take the time to show like different ways that like you know her life is unraveling stuff. You know, like you know, it's, at key moments we are you know kind of seeing her in mediation stuff, um, and then like um, you know different times like you know she's like emotionally losing it like kind of you know yeah and, you know where like she's like just really I mean you know like not sure if, like the husband is trying to pull all these different things and stuff and yeah. meanwhile like she's being cautioned like hey you know you can't really just lose it like that in front of you know these uh, legal people and uh, yeah but she's struggling though I mean she's just really you know trying to you know take care of her daughter like be there and, and then that's another key element is like you know different times Absolutely. she's not able to kind of pick her up and stuff because she's you know fighting to kind of you know keep the keep her daughter and stuff yeah no i mean i think i think what i liked about this is that it's very much sort of focused on just the mother and the daughter and their relationship yeah. and most of it focuses on them and by doing more of that you know it it makes you question more whether this is mm. just a product of her own insanity yes. or whether it's really happening by in, by bringing in well not that i want to get into the remake too early but <laughs> by you know by by focusing on them it, it, it enables you to question everything and it and almost like the the flashback at the sorry spoiler alert the flashback at the <laughs> end um you know you you kind of get this sense of a kind of distant confusion from the daughter in that mm. she was too young to really understand what was going on right. and you don't know if she has actually created this entire story as a way of justifying mm. maybe her mother's suicide. Mm. You know, you just don't know if this is something that mm -hmm. she's sort of like retold herself, or right. you don't know if it's just the mother trying to kind of justify her actions. Um, but it, it's odd because you kind of very early on, you hear the, uh, the aunt saying, you know, Oh, my, my sister, you know, only ever thought of herself right. talking about Yoshimi's mother. Yeah. And, you know, and the teacher also talking about Mitsuko saying, oh, this girl also, you know, always got picked up late and things like this. So mm -hmm. you got this kind of weird thing of even though the mother is trying to correct the mistakes of her own childhood, mm -hmm. you don't know if this is, you know, she just sort of flipped and committed suicide or if right. she's really, or if she really is doing it as part of this sort of ghost story. Right. So this weird kind of, you know, pervasive kind of um, behaviors that get passed down generationally. Yeah. And, and, you know, definitely that's the kind of the, the huge part of the tension is like kind of like different times um, wondering like kind of, you know, is this all kind of really happening? And like I said, um, the daughter's mind or is it happening in her mind or you know yeah. <laughs> and what part of it is like kind of you know actually you know it's a supernatural thing or other things like kind of you know that's going on um, and it's funny how like um, yeah there are definitely moments when you know we're even less sure when other people are involved like the you know realtor who um, actually like um, as a quick kind of mention uh, we'll be watching Shall We Dance as a you know after we talk Brave New World and stuff like that, and he's actually uh, the character in that as well. So, so it's interesting oh, right. how like the connections of these uh, <laughs> actors and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. I, I think you know a lot of the um, other character, auxiliary characters, kind of take quite a back, you know, back seat in this one. Mm. And uh, yeah, so it, it doesn't really, and, and in a way, that's good. It just makes the storytelling more efficient. I would yeah. say. Um, but I mean, you know, fundamentally, I would say this is a story of abandonment more than anything else, because mm. you, you know that her mm. as a mother, she was, was abandoned as a child from what you can infer from what the answer is. And, you know, you're just seeing the same things. And they're, I mean, they're very heavy handed in that, like they say, <laughs> you know, kids of divorced parents, you know, or oh, we see them like this, you know, making up mm. imaginary friends and, you know, getting into various problems. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of, you see the same thing happening with her daughter and there's lots of sort of things where she's, um, you know, having been picked up late or she goes missing in the apartment. And the funny thing is that what, what's, what's the most sort of psychologically affecting about that is that you know this is Yoshimi's deepest fear, mm. that she's going to be a bad mother and she's going to neglect right. this child, all these parts. And that's exactly what happens with the kid. <laughs> the kid just goes off to the most dangerous places and and just goes missing on a fairly regular basis so um 
yeah, it, it's kind of, this is kind of a bit like um, Pixar's Inside Out in that it's very mm. much kind of a horror movie for parents. You know, it's kind <laughs> of, you know, it plays on all of your anxieties about, you know, not picking up your child in time or your child going <laughs> wandering off and going missing or, or, you know, not taking good care of your kid in a house mm. that's falling apart or stuff like this. So, right. Yeah. So um, the, the purse itself, like, it's funny how, mm. like, we've seen, like, kind of red being used it's almost like kind of, you know, anytime that like something I feel like that uh, between like kind of the red tape, um, you know, and pulse stuff uh, yeah. and other times like kind of, you know, red just seems to be something that like, you know, there's a red tree that like, I mean, when they really want to draw your attention to it, it's almost in a way like I feel like it was almost like a trend that started with like maybe either, you know, Spielberg and the girl, and the yeah. kind of, you know, um, you know, the, the red, uh, what's it called? Uh, Schind Schindler's List. Schindler's List, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Or like uh, in Jedi Shalomon, where different times you had uh, red kind of you know um, pop up or different it, times. The red oh, balloon. It, yes. Yeah. And what's funny for me about that is also like in the Asian culture, red is not supposed to be an evil color. It's supposed to be like kind of very much a you know when you are actually in in weddings, unlike kind of Western you know kind of weddings where you're you know we're wearing uh, white uh, gowns and stuff, you're wearing red like you know like in. Um, in terms of for the bride and stuff like that and this and all the decorations are red and it's for you know this kind of celebration so it's a very much a festive color and yet in these you know horror movies i mean red is like kind of basically like you know almost like kind of a sign of the evil and stuff like that to come yeah yeah absolutely i mean in this i suppose the purse was the thing that you know mitsuku loves the most you know hence why mm -hmm. she even you know got into the the accident in the right, first place right. but um but also just from a sort of a color palette of the movie you know a lot of it is very kind of blue and dismal for most yeah. of the movie and it's you've got this sort of yellow hues with the kind of with the with the flashback sequences mm -hmm. and the red really stands out because there's not a lot of warm tones anywhere in this yeah. movie except for the bag <laughs> which really kind of like you know is front and center yeah I, I wonder also like kind of you know the the, the palette itself, like, kind of, is really just how, like, kind of, you know, um, the people see, like, kind of, you know, like city life and stuff. I mean, you know, like, we, mm. we haven't really um, gone into the country except for, like, you know, in the original The Ring and stuff, and where, like, kind of, you know, out in the woods and all kind of stuff. Um, you know, we just is at the lush green. And um, generally speaking, I feel like a lot of these movies, like when they're showing like Japan and city life, I mean, it's very bleak. It's very like kind of austere. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's, yeah, it does seem like and I, the, the cities do have this connotation with being, you know, threatened. Well, not really threatening, but just kind of dismal and bleak and mm. lifeless in a way. They're never really portrayed in very um, happy or joyful ways a lot of the time. Um, you know, I mean, you just have to look at sort of anime either does one or two things. It, it will portray a city in the future as kind mm -hmm. of like bright and sort of right. interesting, but still quite imposing in a way. Yeah. Whereas, you know, you've got, you just have to look at, you know, anime of like Studio Ghibli and mm -hmm. everything is just in the countryside and it's these lush forests. And even when it's set in the future, it's right. sort of set in these really sort of idyllic kind of places in, in, the, in the middle of the countryside. So I think in a way, you know, the movie going experience, if you think about it, you're in a tiny apartment block in Tokyo, <laughs> you know, probably going to the cinema and escape to these sort of lush visuals of the countryside is probably a nice kind of escape in a way. Right. And, and I actually kind of think if you notice as well with all of these J horror movies, there's a lot of, there's very few scenes of lots of crowded people together. It's often yeah. kind of quite isolated. And in some respects, even though it's kind of horror, it's quite peaceful. So I wonder if in a way, even, you know, they kind of like this kind of serenity and peacefulness, even mm. in the horror movies, as an escape from the sort of busy, well, I don't know, I'm just in... No, that's that's a great point, you know, I think. Say, yeah. yeah, because like certainly, um, you know, you, you're, yeah, generally speaking, it, in Tokyo, like kind of, you know, you're you're not going to really find too many places that like, you know, like you said, that where you're getting away from people and kind of having the quiet, whatever. Uh, just having been there, like kind of, you know, only like, you know, once in my life so far, um, I, I tell you, like, uh, um, it was really odd to um, go to, like, this kind of garden that they, you know, had the, you know, tea ceremony, and where it's, like, in the middle of the city, and I don't, I'm not even sure how I can, I, I guess it must be in the way the architecture was that, like, they basically blocked off a lot of the noise 
Um, mm. But I tell you, like it, it was, it was like very much like you know when you walked through the the um, the doorway, the gate, and stuff like that to this um, space and seeing like kind of you know like almost what you would kind of picture as a um, you know the the Japanese Zen garden kind of thing, whatever, and then going to this tea ceremony. I could definitely see the appeal of it. And, you know, it wasn't a cheap experience by any means. And I think part of it was mm -hmm. just paying for just getting away from like, you know, like, cause the minute you're like outside the, the doors and stuff, you're back into like it, like kind of, you know, the yeah. you know, Tokyo where it's like, like you said, the traffic and the buzz and the noise and, you know, just constantly being bombarded and everything. Yeah. And it's funny they have that, you know, it's often portrayed that way because from looking at places like Shinjuku and, Places like that, they seem like quite sort of lively, yeah. fun places to walk around. So it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting where they're portrayed that way. Um, yeah, I, did you find it scary at all? This movie? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think to me, like it wasn't a a scary in the sense of horror that like it was definitely much. You know, I would say it's like more like a psychological thriller is the way I would mm, think of it. And, yeah. You know, where uh, um, you were kind of really just, yeah, wondering about like kind of what was really going on. And um, you, the only thing that kind of was actually scary to me was the water. <laughs> like, kind of, you know, that like when it was kind of came out with this kind of, you know, brownish, brackish kind of like, I was like, oh my God. Like, that, that to me was the horror. It was like kind of the, the thought of like drinking from that or like kind of, you know, bathing yeah. it in it. That, that kind of like was, was pretty horrific. Or the plumbing bill, you know. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I didn't really find it very scary. Like you said, it's just kind of, it's slightly creepy, but it's more just mm. the psychological element that, that sort of, that, that was sort of slight, was effective. I mean, it's a good story and I think it's mm. a good movie, but not a particularly scary one. And I think that's what, if we're looking at a trend, I would say in a way, mm -hmm. the J-horror movies have been getting less and less scary as they've been <laughs> going on. And that may be why, I, I think they've been getting, you know, good in different ways, mm. and very thought-provoking movies, but right. not necessarily, you know, out and out, um, scary movies, so it may be that maybe why we don't see as many Western remakes after this mm. point. Yeah, I, I think they they kind of like um, to me what kind of ran the course also I think was because when they tried to do the remakes, you know, they also like kind of saw their returns kind of going down because like you know the Ring and the Grudge are like kind of you know home runs and stuff because you know they made kind of multiples of you know their budget with. Uh, in terms of box office sales, and then you know, kind of as time went on, it's like, oh, we're not, it's not quite doing that anymore, and stuff like that. Yeah. And then they kind of that's basically pulled back, I think. I think so. It's, it's funny how Hollywood like absolutely kind of goes back to that, like, you know, if it's making the money, they're they'll keep kind of cranking them out. And then I guess yeah. the other thing was, of course, then they started doing kind of the sequels to The Ring Grudge and all that. They they were like kind of like, well, okay, you know, these these new, uh, what's called. Uh, remakes that we're doing aren't quite working let's go back to the um what's called the, the the ones that did work and let's just kind of you know let's just do some more stories based on that and stuff well i think as well they just kind of they took this idea of viewing horror as a as you know in reinventing it in a sort of a meta way for mm -hmm. your own things as what happened because then you got all the scream movies and right, you know right. final destination which kind of just reinvented that whole kind of urban myth Mm. Um, thing and it was it seemed to be either a, a kind of a meta understanding of horror on one side or we got into the kind of the torture porn stuff on the yeah. other side with hostile and saw and everything else like that which um yeah which is another story altogether but yeah um yeah I'm, I'm, apart from that i um you know we did also see a bit of grainy videotape because we had the girl mm. showing up on the elevator video Right. Um, but it was very, very sort of slight glimpses of um, horror or even, you know, the ghost at all. It was just a few, yeah. you know, um, subtle glimpses there. It made mm. The Ring look almost like a, a Western horror movie in comparison mm. because uh, mm. it was very, very subtle in this. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. So I guess uh, what's called, I'll quickly mention that, um, you know, as you know, I, I shared with Dan that, uh, you know, there's this bizarre kind of story, uh, and we'll definitely share links for it as well. That, like, uh, uh, this mm. girl, uh, Elise Lamb, who ended up like almost copying the story. And you yeah. know, like, like I, you know, I had no idea whether or not she actually watched the movie, or you know, certainly it happened, you know, well after 
this movie, you know, the actually either this movie or the remake came out. Um, but it's funny because I just remember coming across that story and then like forgetting about it, like kind of, you know, so then when I watched this, you know, watch Dark Water, I kind of like go, I seem to remember a, a similar movie. And then like, I kind of looked, uh, looked it up and stuff like that. And of course it wasn't a movie, it was an actual story. Like, so it was just bizarre that, you know, this girl, I kind of basically just, you know, the same thing happened where she ends up in this water tower. And then like people only like realize that when they turn on the tap that like something was going on and stuff. Yeah, and there's even sort of video footage of her right, right, right. You know, l- looking looking almost like, like she's talking to someone who's yeah. like a little girl or something in the elevator and right. everything else. Um, I mean, I would have thought, seeing as this was 2014, um, you know, I would say she had definitely had to have seen it. And mm. in a way, this is, you know, I think this is just this bigger trend of, real life and fantasy kind of like gradually merging and the lines blurring. And I, I think this is someone who felt uh, a kind of tragedy in their own life because mm. it's quite a tragic story, really, Dark Water. Mm. Yeah. And that, that maybe resonated with her. And I think in a way there's this kind of weird thing where people want to entwine their own lives into that, that of a story that will pervade beyond their own life, I think, in a way. Mm. Um, I I don't think it's a coincidence. I think this is definitely something where she was highly influenced by that, by that film. And I, I don't, you know, you see this with sort of people who do shootings and things like this, they try mm. and entwine their own lives into a sort of a fictional narrative mm. in a way, because they know some, somewhere, you know, that a fictional narrative is going to live beyond your, your own life. Mm. So it's, this weird sort of blurring, but I, I mean, the fact that it's almost exactly the same thing, yeah can't be can't be a coincidence in my opinion but yeah yeah and and you know the the water tower in you know in the real life version of stuff i mean it's you, to me she could not have accidentally fell in she had to have intentionally yeah. you know because you know when you look at the setup in the video and stuff like that it's it took effort to kind of you know get to that position it wasn't like you know even anything like the one in the movie where like kind of you know like if you're kind of poking around you can kind of you know fall into it and stuff i mean that one in in real life she like you know had to like gone through a lot of effort to kind of get on top of there and you know basically you know kind of just almost threw her, throw herself in and stuff so yeah 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 i don't know it's it's tragic but i think it's it's yeah there's got to be something in it mm-hmm. some connection so well, yes, time to move on to the US yeah. remake, I guess. Yeah. Time to move on to the US yeah. remake, I guess. Yeah. Definitely. So once again, Jennifer Connelly, um, this time as uh, the mother of uh, Dahlia and um, the daughter, who actually, ironically. Um, you know, I just kind of looked her up and then apparently she retired <laughs> from acting, you know, like, uh, you know, only a few years after that and stuff. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it was just kind of like funny how that's kind of like um, Charlie from uh, the Willy Wonka series where, or the, the original movie that, uh, mm-hmm. you know, they just basically had a burst of like kind of, you know, their, their acting and stuff and then kind of moved on and stuff. Um, well, as we've been discussing offline, uh, we've been sort of <laughs> interested in Scotty Bowers' uh, book, Full Service. And when you read some of the stuff in that, eh, it's not surprising that some people just want to get out of uh, show business completely. And probably better so, yeah. that they did. Yeah. <laughs> more, more hold. Yeah, probably better, definitely. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's in, what I thought was interesting in, in this was the way Jennifer Connelly um, portrayed the mother because mm. they'd obviously changed it in a way. Mm-hmm. She's not a very fluffy mum, like the Japanese <laughs> one is, so to speak. Mm. Um, and you get you get uh, the impression that she's not losing her mind as much as the Japanese one, because I think in a way they didn't they didn't think it would be realistic to portray a single mum as so um, sort of submissive to their environment and losing control as much mm. as in the Japanese one. I would say they had a, as a much sort of stronger character probably mm. to identify more with the type of audience that's going to go and watch a horror movie mm. a female audience is, you know they're probably going to be a fairly sort of strong-willed i guess or just mm. i can just sort of see 
if you try to portray it in the same way as the Japanese original people would have said, oh, she's too much of a sort of victimized female. I think yeah. already we were kind of in uh, that kind of frame of mind. So, um, so in a way you kind of, I mean, I understand that. And I think it's effective in a way because it, it, it brings you more in to her as a character, but you do lose a lot of this kind of effect of, is it her making mm. this up or is it, right. you know, just the circumstance or the supernatural? It's, at the same time though, I feel like, um, you know, she really portrays a mother that's kind of, again, kind of going on hints and stuff. I mean, you know, mm. it, it's maybe, like you said, she's definitely a very strong character. And so that's like kind of uh, a key difference, like you said, between um, her and the Japanese mother and stuff like that. But uh, I, I, at the same time, um, you know, she's like kind of really, uh, you know, like she's medicating herself, like kind of, you know, like a, a lot. And, yeah. And, and it's more like her, I feel like kind of that she's fighting off, like kind of, you know, like, like she's, she's really just, you know, trying to hold on, like kind of, uh, maybe not to necessarily her sanity, but just like where emotionally she's like kind of, you know, you know, losing it in some ways and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I would say in the Japanese original, you kind of get the, the feeling that the odds are stacked against her by her own making in a way. Like mm. it's partially her fault of why this is happening. In this one, what they've done is they've introduced all these external forces to make you feel like it, the odds are getting stacked up against her, but, mm. but aren't her things. So you've got like the dodgy realtor who's who's sort of like, she has to sort of haggle with to try and get the right. the building repaired. She's got the lawyer who's, who, is he honest? Is he not honest? You know, mm. they sort of build that character out quite a lot. You've got the, the, the maintenance guy whose character is a lot more fleshed out and you don't know if he's actually to blame or is he not. Yeah. You've got like the teenage kids who are playing pranks on her. Right. You've got the husband. You don't know <laughs> if he's part of it. Um, so yeah, there's a lot more kind of external factors, and you've got her. You know, the drugs are clearly like you know another f external kind of force outside of her own mm. control that, that's affecting her her state of mind. So they've yeah they've kind of just they've made it more of a an outward rather than an inward kind of uh, struggle, I would say. Yeah, I, th I think one thing that, um, you know, along that lines, though, is that like to achieve, like kind of to make the struggle more real or kind of, um, you know, stronger is that like, uh, you know, whereas in the Japanese one, the characters, I have to agree that a little bit more disposable than the usual J-horror kind of setup. These characters in the American version, you know, they're, they're def definitely very venerable, I thought, like kind of, you know, mm. like between John C. Riley playing the, you know, the realtor, um, you know, Doug Gray Scott is the um, the husband and stuff like that. Um, mm. You know, even like kind of, you know, the, the manager in this case, where, you know, he's Peter Post the way um, he's not a, um, he, he's got some character to it. Like, so, you, oh, know, definitely, yeah. you know, each of these you know, folks are pretty much like you, you kind of, um, they, they stand out like kind of and, and even again um the, the attorney uh tim roth you know yet i mean he just anytime he shows up in a, you know, a movie like you kind of almost find it hard to kind of forget him and stuff absolutely yeah and, and they and as i said they did try to sort of flesh out those things although i mean to be honest with you i just kind of felt like it was unnecessary padding to the story mm. it just kind of like it added another that you take out of that you could have cut the film down by half an hour and it would have been <laughs> a much more efficient kind of movie I mean, my other problem with it was that it kind of turned into a bit more of a murder mystery than the original. Oh. In that you, you know, the police do actually find the body, yeah. and the ca and the case is solved at the end. Right. And um, you know, you you've kind of got the uh, it's more explicit in that um, mm. you know she has to they they spell it out for you like oh she has to sacrifice herself to protect right. her daughter and become the mother of that one. So it's kind of like, it, again, it's just a little more exp exposition and less visual storytelling mm. than the original. Um, but there's this kind of, I mean, it, it sort of falls into this thing of like, you think there's an ending and then they kind of like, you yeah. know, they give you that, that's a sort of surprise. Um, so, yeah. And, you know, it, it, it kind of, that by making Pete Postlethwaite's character as the maintenance guy, they kind of pretty much blame him. He's kind of like the bad guy yeah, of yeah. the movie, whereas there right. really wasn't, 
you know, in, in the original, he's just like an old maintenance guy who doesn't mm. really know what's going on. Mm. And he's not, he seems fairly blameless or there's no kind of evil intent. Whereas right. there is more kind of evil intent sort of blamed. And, you know, again, it's like the abusive parents that that story is more kind of described to you as, a, as, as the audience, whereas it's much more of a mystery. In fact, I, and I think right. the overall theme of the movie, because it's kind of like neglect and you don't know really why these mothers are neglecting their kids. Mm-hmm. Um, that for me is more effective in the original because it leaves you hanging. Like you don't have mm. a, a solid explanation for why this is happening or is this going to happen again? You kind of get the feeling at the end of the US one that mm-hmm. kind of everything's all right. You know, if you mm-hmm. went and stayed in that apartment block, ah, you'd be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, you know, kind of gets to the, the um, you know, the question we've had before about like, okay, you know, it seems like almost a, you know, quote unquote, happier ending. And is that more satisfying than, you know, like kind of uh, one that like, you know, for the Japanese uh, original, it, it's, um, I, I mean, in some ways that's also, I don't know about happy, but it, it's a, um, it's, it's one that's kind of a little more, more uplifting or kind of, um, you know, more positive and stuff. And, you know, I guess maybe that's the question. Like, which, which do you feel like kind of, I, I, I feel like you're, you're, um, it, you're saying that like the, the Japanese one had the more effective ending and stuff. Um, well, yeah, this is the interesting thing because they both treat the endings differently. Mm-hmm. Um, and if we haven't mentioned it already, as always, spoiler alert. Right, 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 right. In, in a way, I kind of yeah it was it was they were both sort of different and interesting in their own ways i actually kind of liked what they did with the u.s remake okay and the um they by humanizing the husband character more and making Mm. her have this kind of reconciliation with him it um it does kind of throw you off the scent that there's going to be this this sort of worse ending to come right um which was kind of effective in terms of the twist but what it did was it downplayed the isolation and the tension for her character during the rest of the movie. Mm. So that kind of, it kind of, you know, watered that down a bit, no Mm. pun intended, but um, (laughs) it did kind of throw you off for the, for the slightly kind of twist ending, which I thought was actually, I actually liked. Um, And I kind of preferred that in a way to the 10 years later and the daughter coming back. Mm. And there's this weird Mm -hmm. sort of, you know, reconciliation that almost felt like a sort of Takeshi Miyake kind of, maneuver in a movie just sort of Mm -hmm. like a weird kind of jump 10 Mm -hmm. years in the future that i didn't find that effective in Mm. in the original but what i would say is that i came away from the u.s remake just feeling slightly depressed like it was kind of just a tragic kind of story okay whereas with the original there's like this kind of pervasive kind of dread that lasts Mm. beyond the movie because there is no clear explanation. Right. The body's never found. You just get this feeling this, this is a cycle that will just keep on repeating. Mm. Um, So for me, that's why it's more effective. It just leaves you hanging a bit more than, than the U S remake. Yeah. I think that's a funny thing. Like um, with, with the uh, American version is, um, you know, Douglas Scott, I feel like different times he's almost like, you know, if you, um, get him in a movie it i feel like the shorthand is that like you're not supposed to like him <laughs> like, that's, yeah, that's like yeah, kind of right. that's like kind of just right away which is funny because um apparently like he um you know was actually originally planned to play wolverine uh, but because of you know mi2 delays and like uh you know like a motorcycle accident from the movie um you know he, he yeah he didn't get, get the role obviously stuff like that and the rest is history so to speak and um yeah, I, and we're, we're going to see him also again in, in uh, Day of the Chiffage, which is kind of like a, another funny right. kind of, you know, connection to, you know, these remakes and stuff like that. But having him, like, almost, like, be redeemed um, in the end, I thought, like, kind of, it caught me off by surprise, actually. I, I didn't really mm. expect that to happen. And, and I thought that was kind of, you know, um, made it where... You know, on the one hand, I agree that it kind of downplayed a little bit, like kind of the, the things that happened with the mother. But I feel like um, it, it kind of like went up with the idea that, um, you know, that instead of the open ended um, ending of the Japanese version, that, you know, maybe like there is kind of a little bit, you know, of hope, you know, like kind of that, like it's not yeah, all, yeah. all, it's not just, uh, 
you know, a, a endless cycle and stuff like that, which I think is also like um, different times, like the, um, do, the contrast with these J horror movies that like, they're more willing to kind of, you know, like other than the traditional horror open endings, so, so to speak and stuff, or kind of mm-hmm. that like um, on, on the one hand, um, things are, you know, likely to kind of be recreated, but they, they tend to do it on a, on a less, um, uh, overtly horror um, reason, I guess. And it's kind of more like that. It's just generally, oh, that's just the way, you know, like kind of, you know, the world works. Like it, it's, it's kind of more mm. organic to, I think um, the Japanese horror world, I guess is, is to me versus like, I feel like different times with, with uh, Western horror, it's almost like kind of that, like they do it more as, okay, this is how we end, you know, like, western horror movies you know that kind of thing i know yeah well it, it, it creates more kind of ups and downs and the sort mm. of flow of the movie you know you've got like the the relaxation that they found the body you know it, it's yeah. and i said this i don't know if i said this before but it's weird uh-huh. in, in every other movie when you see the flashing lights of a police car mm. it means like there's going to be action and danger and in mm. horror movie it's like you you breathe a sigh of relief because you right, know, right, the police right. have shown up and some you know there's more people no one's going to be isolated anymore and all this kind of thing so <laughs> So it was quite effective in that respect. They give you this kind of like respite while, uh, mm. you know, she has the reconciliation, they find the body. And then it kind of, it, unfortunately though, it doesn't, it has this kind of dramatic note to the end, but it's still not very mm. creepy, but it just makes it more tragic because you kind of felt like they mm. actually kind of got things sorted out and then, you know, she has to die. So, right. yeah. That's, um, <laughs> I mean, that would actually be my, I kind of felt though, after watching something like The Grudge, where you felt like every single moment was a creepy <laughs> experience, like every, nothing was wasted. It was like right. such a lean, every single scene was creepy. In this one, you kind of felt they could have added more mm. creepiness into both the original <laughs> and the remake in a way. There could have been a lot more kind of stuff. Mm. I don't know. I mean, I think, I think playing on the daughter... Um, either being kind of taken over by Mitsuko mm-hmm. or oh. this this kind of surrogate Mitsuko for the daughter could have been that element was could have been played up more like I really liked in the Japanese one the bit where she's in the elevator at the mm-hmm. start and it could have been in the US one or maybe I just didn't notice it but she, you know she goes down and she holds the hand in the elevator yeah. and she realizes it's not a daughter <laughs> right. that was, you know that was really effective and just of course the bit at the end with the bath but you know, mm. I felt like those were the only two bits where they really made the most of that. And they could have, mm. you know, I'm sure there could have been lots of other opportunities where you had this idea of displacing the, the physical daughter with the ghost daughter. That yeah. would have been kind of freaky. And I'm sure it's been done in lots of other U.S. horror <laughs> movies since then. But, right. Uh, yeah. The, the, the one in the American version, you know, I kind of, I thought that that was actually pretty effective. Like we're... Um, she sees the daughter, and you're kind of going, "Oh crap, that's yeah. not the daughter." Yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. And that then, was well and then, done. Yeah, and then and then she's sitting next to her, and you don't see the face because of the hood, which, like, mm. in a little way, was like kind of felt like a setup. But you know, you kind of went along with it, and and then like like you know, it turns out to not you know to be like or it, like it, it, it's um it was like definitely a um what's called diversion, or like kind of you know like kind of one of those where. You know, like okay, you think you, you you kind of know what's going on, and then the, you know the reveal, of course, like kind of you know major spoilers that like you know that okay, it, it's it's um you know not like what you thought and stuff like that. I thought that was like done effectively. I thought that was like kind of not quite a scare, but um, but it was like it, I thought overall it had a nice suspense, a nice kind of you know like yeah 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 no i mean i watched that with my mum actually and she got a bit creeped out by that oh scene. really but uh, but but yeah i mean that was the only scene really i felt yeah. that kind of actually was even vaguely creepy in the movie the other big problem i have with the remake is that i actually watched it the wrong way around so i watched the remake and okay. then i watched the original okay and i noticed like in the so in the in the u.s one pretty much as soon as the little girl goes up on the on the roof you yeah. see the water tower it's in shot yeah, and they kind of I make know. a point of it so it's kind of like, oh, well, that's, that's obviously, you know, <laughs> that's where she is. And in the Japanese original, they don't mm. actually even show the water tower right. in, in, in any shot until about halfway through the movie yeah. when they've already established all the other kind of weird things going on. So that was a real kind of just like, ah, you know, <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't need that much foreshadowing. You could have mm. just let, held out on that. Yeah, in fact, what they do is they show you this little, in the Japanese one, they show uh-huh. this little drain 
rather mm. than the water tower itself and then they show you the water going through the drain so you think oh okay. it's the little girl in the drain right but um yeah not not in the yeah that was pretty heavy-handed like it was you know? yeah disappointing <laughs> yeah but um yeah overall i mean i I didn't. I didn't dislike the the US remake. I thought it was actually pretty good. Um, yeah. But it was just a bit long winded, and it mm. it just didn't need to be half an hour longer than the original. So I was surprised that they had a you know Hello Kitty uh, you know placement. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, to me, like, you know, I, I'm not sure what like kind of um, you know how they kind of you know uh, what's called reach for that because you would think that like you know something that's like a kid friendly. Oh, 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 and that, that's like a point, another session we got to have too. So you have a kid friendly kind of, you know, item and stuff like that. And, you know, it's, it's in a, you know, theoretically a horror movie and everything. So mm. it's kind of like just something that, like, it, it, I mean, you know, in terms of movie wise, it definitely was very out of place. And I thought that was kind of, you know, effective in that sense. Mm. But um, at the same time, though, I think what it is is that, like, you know, this is a Buena Vista picture. So it definitely has that, you know, Disney, um, you know, stamp of approval. And so I think that's why it kind of, they kept it PG-13, which I guess, you know, like when you, you know, you, you almost don't realize it. Like to me, I I didn't think of that as a distraction because some people say that like, that like horror movies just have to be art to be kind of really, you know, scary or to be really good and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. I felt like in this case, it, it didn't need it. No, I mean, you can do it in other ways. I mean, I, it's hard to say though that, um, I mean, if you took out, the initial scene in the original Japanese grudge with the, the dad kind of <laughs> butchering the cat and the, mm. uh, and, and the, the rest of the family, could the rest of it actually be a PG 13? Do you think? Hmm. Cause there isn't really any gore no. really after yeah. that point. That's true. Um, most of it is just kind of general creepiness. I think Yeah. if I, I could be mistaken, but I don't remember a lot after that. So, Right. But I mean, can you imagine if they made a, a movie as scary as The Grudge and mm. released it in PG thirteen? It would be, <laughs> it'd be pretty cool in a way. But I just don't. I, I don't know. I've never seen anything that's really been that scary in uh, in what made in the US. So. Well, I mean, Poltergeist was, was a pretty. pretty Actually, good, uh, Poltergeist is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's like they almost did that to kind of um, you know defy you know the kind of the, yeah. that idea and stuff. So yeah. Yeah. And I suppose Disney's been making terrifying new movies for kids for years, right? With That's true. Deers being burnt to death in forests, and, <laughs> you know, things like this, and yeah, people being sucked in, sucked into black holes and being turned into being churned up by robot blades, and, and somehow it's a, like a right. Year. But um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So any, any other kind of last thoughts about like kind of, um, you know, oh, one other quick mention is um, Angelo um, Baralamenti, uh, you know, from Twin Peaks, uh, you know, fame and stuff like that, uh, provided the music for uh, this remake and stuff. So, yeah. Did he? Oh, yeah. okay. That's interesting. You would have thought it, it very much kind of faded into the background. I would have thought it yeah. would have been much more noticeable if it was him. That's interesting. Mm. Okay. I didn't, didn't, I'm normally the one to pick up on the, on the soundtrack, mm -hmm. so I'm surprised I didn't, I didn't. See, that. I felt like he very intensely wanted to kind of just make it where like um, you know it's just all about atmosphere like because he totally. I think yeah. I think his music's really made to do that you know and I think in this case they, he really I kind of wanted to just focus on kind of you know just creating different atmosphere throughout and, and I felt like it was achieved because Definitely, you know, like different yeah. times it just kind of really fit the um, you know the, the kind of dreariness of this kind of you know like this this place that's like um, you know by New York, but it's not New York, and it's like kind of you know like it, which like going back to like kind of the the whole thing was like like um the daughter was like kind of really the one that like you know like oh you know do we have to move there and all that kind of stuff and it's you know the thing I had to laugh at was that it was a Hello Kitty <laughs> first that like sealed the deal for them you know like um, know, right? because like she absolutely was ref refusing to kind of go along with it but then once she saw that first you know like know. And, and the idea that she was going to get it in seven days that was that was enough to sell her yeah 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 it's kind of like a reverse thing of ring really isn't it seven mm. days she gets the purse but <laughs> loses a mum in the process yeah but um the other yeah i mean I, I think you're right about the soundtrack though it was because i didn't notice it that shows mm. you how good it was because in all of the other remakes like the ring the, the sound the, the score is so over the top compared to the original yeah. and also the same with the grudge it was just way too much 
um, mm. and actually took me out of the experience. But so this one was actually very well done in that respect. And that's the kind of the shame I feel about this. Is I feel like this was actually really well crafted. The performance mm -hmm. is really good, but it just it was just it wasn't really particularly scary or creepy. Really, right. that was the, the real problem with it. Uh, well, I mean, I mean, I felt like it just kind of matched the original in that sense that like, you know, we're, yeah. we're really just in the um, this kind of psychological area. And so that that to me was what worked with the this remake. I would say out of all the different ones you've watched, you know, in terms of remakes, this was the strongest in terms of yeah. that, like it, it um, you know, achieved what I felt like kind of, you know, went out to do was like kind of, you know, to do something that was faithful to the source material, but, you know, enough to stand out on its own and stuff. So that's, that's what I felt like it, it did achieve. Yeah. I put this as like probably the best remake and then probably the ring mm. as the second, um, right. or maybe the grudge. I don't know. One of those two probably. Okay. Um, yeah. Actually I did quite like the grudge, even the, the remake of it. So yeah, I mm. probably put the grudge second and then ring okay. third and then it's a toss up between pulse and uh, <laughs> one missed call. It's both <laughs> equally awful, but um, right. yeah. If they'd taken out the horse sequence in the ring, then that probably would have made it considerably better. But anyway, so, I mean, I guess this is the end of our scary stroke depressing October. And now it's <laughs> time for festivities and jolly jollity with right. Shall We Dance, right? Yeah, I, I thought that, that this would be a really good one to kind of, um, you know, to kind of change the tone a little bit with the uh, Japanese movies, but also I felt like it's in this particular movie. I have to admit that um, I, I have like personal kind of um, you know connections with it that I'll, I'll discuss. But uh, to me, like it's also uh, a glimpse into you know like kind of the the Japanese society and um, it, it much more so than, than the horror movies. I mean, the horror movies kind of do have given us glimpses. But this one, I think, will really kind of, you know, just, just like kind of, it nails a lot of things. Like, and, and it's funny, though, is that like different times we can have that and, you know, in a very much lighter and comic kind of tone. And that, that's like what I think we'll, we'll see. And then it'll be interesting, of course, as always, to kind of compare how well does the American version stand up to, to what that achieves and stuff. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll be looking at that uh, after, you know, like kind of uh, the plans to discuss Brave New World and, it, the different kind of versions of that. Um, and then we'll move on to um, something that's still somewhat Eastern, but a uh, little bit more to the festivities, uh, Eat, Drink, Man, Woman, which kind of basically is the, um, you know, food and, uh, you know, how different times that that's a core part of our cultures and stuff. So um, that's coming up. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, once again, I'm John Chang with Dan Denimans and uh, we will see you again soon.